Welcome to Afrocentricity. I am your host, Michael Washington. Our topic is white privilege laws and white supremacy laws. This is part two of our panel discussion, which is moderated by Daniel Buford. Let's take a look. Dr. Miles, uh, now, uh, Diana, uh, I'm going to ask you the same question. Would you identify examples of white privilege laws and white supremacy laws that are found in the current or even past efforts by the Republican Party to suppress African American voting uh, in the 2022 election? Thank you, Dan <coughs> Daniel. And um, I just want to say that anything that I've learned about race and racism and privilege has come from um, people of color, that there's no way I could have figured this out by myself. And so, so many of my mentors are in this room and I have to recognize Dr. Michael Washington, Daniel Buford, <coughs> excuse me, and David Billings as teaching me so much <coughs> about the history of this country. Um, <clears throat> allergies, so sorry. <clears throat> White supremacy is the basic foundation and building blocks of this nation. It was started out of an idea of white supremacy. It was started because this nation was supposed to be white and continues to be white. <clears throat> but if you don't understand race and racism, you're not going to understand, excuse me, you're not going to understand how this has unfolded and how it has benefited every white person <clears throat> that ever became white in this nation. It's a foundation that I think is pretty masterful and pretty brilliant in creating a smoke spring to hide the original intentions of what we were doing with this that white supremacy foundation <clears throat> from people who would become white. And that is the point of it, is to keep, keep us in the dark, those of us are white in the dark, um, so that we don't fight against things that are harming not only people of color, but harming everybody in this country by the outcomes of our institutions. We are a nation of people that is not only ahistoric, but we are also anti-historic people, which is important in keeping the illusion alive that all people are created equal and we all have an equal chance in this country. If we knew the truth, there might be some changes coming in this country. Every law that is passed, I mean, I, David, I agree with every single thing you said, and I was going to say a lot of it because I learned it from you, so you threw me off a little bit there, but thank you, David. Um, um, <clears throat> every law has can become a white supremacy law, no matter what it's cloaked in, and we cloak it in, in, um, in ways that people don't recognize how it can become um, <clears throat> white supremacy law. Um, our Ariel Allen of NYU said, the nostalgia of ignorance. We are living in a country that does not understand history and there's great nostalgia and peace and, and not understanding and becoming ignorant of everything. I think this one statement that Joe, Joe Barnes said, Reverend Joe Barnes said, says it all. Every system and institution in the, un in the United States was originally created and structured legally and intentionally to serve white people exclusively. Every institution was set up that way. Um, and it has been upheld by every law in, in the Supreme Court in this country. <clears throat> but to understand that, we have to understand how did they control white people to, to fight for a system that actually harms us too. We had to develop something called race. <clears throat> and the development of race then also um, <clears throat> puts the, um, the, the screen over our eyes so we can't see what's happening. Race was created to make sure that whites would always come out on top and give us a way to hold our power and privilege in, in place by creating subclasses of human beings so that white people <clears throat> begin to understand that they are better than others and you're looking down at who's under you and you're not looking up at who's controlling you 
and creating a system that, that harms us all. <clears throat> Dr. Michael Washington, can I quote you on what is race? I mean, because this is one of the most, do I get an amen or a yes? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Okay. Go on, okay. go on. And, I, and I think this is, this is, besides the statement by Joe Barn, how every institution was created legally and intentionally to, to uh, support white people only, race is when we understand what race is, we'll understand how this, how we as white people have been able to carry this out. Dr. Washington says race is a specious classification of humans created by Europeans or white to number one, to assign human worth and social status using himself or white as a model of humanity and the height of human achievement for the purposes of establishing and maintaining privilege and power for those who would become white. So you put this thing called race, you define race. I mean, race in itself has no essence, but it is the greatest effector of your outcomes in life in the United States and yet has no essence in biology or those, those kinds of ways. <clears throat> if, you, if you go back and you look at the writings of early writers in this country and see what their vision was for the United States, don't read the constitution read what they're saying and what they want this country to become. So Thomas Jefferson wrote, <clears throat> Providence has been pleased to give this one people connected to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the, ver to the same principles of government, very similar in manners and customs, Jefferson looked forward to a time when this continent was covered with this kind of people. So how do you, how do you create the United States from the East Coast to the West Coast? You use poor white people as the colonizers, those of us to steal the land from the natives and from Mexicans and, and, and move us across and, and seed us in the country so it then could become um, a one United States. So in 1804, we had the Louisiana Purchase. 1848, we bought, got the land from, from France, not from natives, from France. So hear me, hear me loud and clear. In 1848, the Treaty of Guada Guadalupe Hidalgo, we got 50% of the land of Mexico. In 1896, the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act gave away 246 million acres of land and all you had to do was go settle on it, be able to live there successfully for five years, build a 12 by 15 structure and be a white person in good standing. And you could get that land. So we're doling the land out to white people. We're making sure that only citizens could own land. And we make sure from 1790 in the, um, in the um, uh, that we said that only white people could become uh, citizens of this of this country. So by the end of the 1800s, three quarters of white people own land. That this is white supremacy in its fullest, right? Three quarters of white people own land by the end of 1800. And today, 46 million people, white people, benefit from this. We create laws that benefit white people and have throughout the history of this country. And if they don't work to our benefit as white people, we change them. And we've seen that happen over and over again. I'm gonna read you one more, one more quote. Reginald Horseman was, was uh, born in England in 1930, but he talks about um, how, how this country, manifest destiny, how this country was set up. And he says, in the middle of the 19th century, a sense of racial destiny permeated the discussion of American progress and future American world destiny. By 1850, the emphasis was on the American Anglo-Saxon as a separate innately superior people who were destined to bring good government, commercial prosperity and Christianity to the American continent and to the world. This was a superior race and inferior races were doomed to subordination, um, subordinate status or extinction. This is our history. This is what got us to where we are today. And one of the greatest uh, 
uh, white supremacy legislation is the fact that we cannot teach this history. It's unfair to everybody in this country, and it's particularly unfair to those of us. <clears throat> building the United States is, Dr. Mooka Jost told me this, building the United States is like thinking about playing the game of Monopoly. <clears throat> and what you do when you play Monopoly is you buy land, you buy land, and then you gain your wealth and you get more and more wealthy. So we, as white people, have been on this, this land for over 400 years. And then we tell people of color, well, you can come on now, 60 years ago, and expect the outcomes to be the same when the laws don't change, but they continue to, um, continue to um, benefit white people. I'll say one more time. Every time there has been a chance in the history of this country where people of color might or, or blacks might have the ability to get some of the rights that they are due, what do we do? We have a back cry by white people to say, what about me? So after the, when the when the enslavement of Africans were entered were was ended, the back cry from white people was free the whites. So we can't be free if all of them got free, right? So free the whites, get the attention on me. There's a chance I might not get all of my rights that I've had throughout the history of this country. So free the whites. After the civil rights movement, when affirmative action came into being, which is quite interesting, that was affirmative action for people of color because white people have had affirmative action since the first time we stepped foot on this land, we've been affirmed in the action. But the back cry from from um, the, the civil rights movement was, um, uh, oh, uh, um, um, she just slipped out of my mind. Um, reverse <laughs> discrimination, I'm sorry. I am 75, Reginald. That's why I can't remember it <laughs> all the time. <laughs> reverse discrimination. It's about me, man. If you give them rights, I'm not gonna have as many rights. These are the cries we have. What was the cry after Obama, the first black man he gets elected to the, to the president of this country? What was the cries that we heard? Most people will say, make America great. That was one of the cries, but there was a much more significant cry. And that cry was take back our country. Take back our country. This is supposed to be ours. And the laws have backed us up. The constitution has backed us up. The Supreme Court has backed us up. Every outcome of every institution has backed us up. And that's what we have to be paying attention to. So we as white people have to wake up, study the history and begin to see how we, even us WMWFs, us well-meaning white folks are holding this system in place because we don't understand how it was put into place. So that's what my cry is, wake up America. A wake up white people, because you actually, it's more dangerous being around liberal white people because you never know which way they're going to fall than it is being around that bigoted people that entered the White House on January 6th, because you know what they're going to do. You don't know what we're going to do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you Diane. Diane. Wow. wow. Okay, okay. Well, well, he just made me want to interject something where Dr. Mike talks. And uh, you remind me of two things. You remind me of something that Dick Gregory said about white liberals. That's, that is that Dick Gregory said that the white liberal is the white person that will hang you from the lowest limb on the tree. So that's what the, the great Dick Gregory said. Um, but, uh, but also when we, uh, when we look at uh, the, these ideas, we, uh, we, we must understand that um, there's a, a certain privilege and bias that, are, that is already built in. So Reverend Frederick Douglass Kirkpatrick, uh, speaking of the Republicans and the Democrats, who uh, today the Democrats are allegedly our friend, but remember that the Republicans are the party of Lincoln. So with, with this kind of duplicity and fork tongues uh, aspect of both parties uh, operating at all times that we've been in this country, he said that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are two wings of the same buzzard. So on, on that note, I will uh, ask Dr. Michael Washington to uh, 
answer that question. You do identify examples of white privilege and white supremacy law found in the current efforts by the Republican Party to suppress African American voting in the 2022 election. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, what I'd like to identify is ways in which we can uh, approach these things from an empowerment perspective. And I'd like to look at, for instance, how the basketball star LeBron James's voting rights group relate to my uh, states that I work and live in. Yeah. So can somebody help Michael maybe turn off your computer? I don't know. I don't no, know. Michael has to turn off his, his microphone. And just Dude, use the microphone in front. Computer. Don't use the, the Zoom microphone. Okay. okay. There you go. There you go. All right. So should I start over or what? Well, let me just say that uh, what comes to my mind is how the celebrities, in this case specifically, uh, basketball star LeBron James uh, has a voting rights group that relate to the states that I work and live in, which are Kentucky and Ohio respectively. From my perspective, uh, LeBron James is modeling the behavior required to prevent black votes from being suppressed. For instance, when he launched his more than a vote group in the wake of the George Floyd murder, he organized members of his community to take a stand against injustice. Some of the members of his celebrity community of black athletes, entertainers, and others, including football quarterback Patrick Mahomes, basketball star Jalen Rose, and actor Kevin Hart. The group mobilizes voters to address criminal justice reform, as well as voter suppression. And he is not shy when it comes to defending the group's activism. In fact, he has been proud to tell the media that he will use his celebrity status as a platform to shed light on the injustice of racism. An example of that is when he called for the arrest of the cops who fired the fatal bullet that killed Breonna Taylor. He informed her family and the Commonwealth of Kentucky of his expectation of justice. When he found out about the voter suppression taking place in the two most populous and diverse cities in Kentucky, Lexington and Louisville, he fired up the issue on Twitter, which exposed to the world that each of the, yes. Yeah, I've com I've muted my computer, which I, I don't know what else to do. Uh, I don't either. I'm not a tech person. You might be able to try muting um, Reverend Buford's account and just have it come out of one account. Maybe it looks like it's coming out of two. That's worked for me before. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, my Okay. We th we think we think Bill just solved it. We're here, Mike. Okay. Let me say yeah. he fired up the issue on Twitter, which exposed to the world that each of the cities had only one in-person polling site. His celebrity star power could have been used. In Kentucky, um, over the past few decades, as Kentucky created one of the worst and most restrictive voting systems in the country. In 2006, before the pandemic, the election performance index ranked Kentucky 44th out of the 50 states 
mostly because Kentucky had no early voting and had stringent requirements to request an absentee ballot. Thanks to the decision made by county clerks in Lexington and Louisville to staff only one polling place for election day during the pandemic was national attention brought to the issue of voter suppression in Kentucky. The attention has resulted in comprehensive plans put in place which include making absentee ballots available for all voters, providing early in-person voting options for 15 days leading up to the election day, and establishing a polling place for election day in-person voting. Other organizations joined up with James's group to focus on the issue of voter suppression in Georgia, where measures included limiting the use of drop boxes to return ballots, requiring photo identification for voting by mail and cutting back early voting on weekends. With the support of many organizations like LeBron's group, the determined voters of Georgia did their part in winning two congressional seats in the office of the presidency for the Democrats. This is precisely the type of effective organizing and mobilizing that must take place within the state of Ohio and several other states if the voters hope to prevent public education from becoming an agent that socializes future voters to be victims of white supremacy. Taking more time. Okay, uh, um, I just got my time made short. Voters must be aware of the power of their vigilance and voting strength. They must use this power to reject white privilege laws that propose to use the curriculum of public education to indoctrinate students with detrimental white biases about the history of the United States, such as teaching students that no racism was involved uh, sy systematically when the founding fathers used the Constitution to deny citizenship to the Indians not taxed and three-fifths of all of the persons, which was a racist way of saying enslaved Africans and Native Americans could not be citizens. Racist because the white founders did not recognize the people from Africa as being fully human. This means that voters must make themselves aware of the movement that opposes the critical race theory. A growing number of Ohio's Republican lawmakers want to put a stop to a new way uh, some schools are teaching history called critical race theory, which is an academic concept based on the idea that racism is more than individual bias but rather a systemic phenomenon that is embedded into our legal system and our laws. Supporters say that critical race theory teaches how racism shaped public policy and life in the United States, while opponents, like the sponsors of House Bill 332, call it a dangerous and divisive theory designed to look at everything from a race-first lens, which they say is the very definition of racism. When Republic, uh, Representative Donald Jones, Republican from Freeport, announced the bill, he said it was an anti voucher that has no place in Ohio schools because students should not be asked to examine their whiteness, end of quote. If passed, House Bill 322 would prohibit schools from requiring teachers to use examples from current events or ongoing controversial issues in, the class, in their classrooms and schools couldn't require lessons about current pieces of legislation or groups lobbying for or against them. The bill bans the State Board of Education, school boards, and school districts from requiring teachers and staff members to adopt certain beliefs, including, quote, the advent of slavery in the territory that is now the United States constituted the true founding of the United States, end of quote. In other words, when discussing the colonial economies, teachers would not be required to teach their students that the founding of the United States could not have occurred without the production of tobacco, which necessitated slave labor. That's why George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe were all slaveholders from Virginia. Neither will teachers be required to inform their students that during the colonial period, the wealth created throughout the entire Western world depended on the capture of and trade in Africans who were in bondage. The absence of this knowledge prevents students from knowing the difference between immigration from Europe, from European countries, and forced immigration from Africa or the international slave trade. 
Another belief that teachers will not be required to teach is, quote, that slavery and racism are anything other than deviations from true American values like liberty and equality. In other words, teachers are not required to teach students that slavery was a major issue that led to the Civil War or that legitimate colonial, state, and federal governments controlled by whites imposed racism on the Native American and Mexican populations by white explorers, pioneers, and settlers who manifested their destiny by seizing the continent from sea to shiny sea. The passage of House Bill 322 would also compel teachers to teach their students that the legal system known as Jim Crow segregation was a mere deviation from true American values like liberty and equality. Finally, states like Idaho, Tennessee, Rhode Island, and Texas have all introduced bills to ban the teaching of critical race theory in public schools. In Texas, Republican State, Re uh, State Representative Steve Toth, Toth is the primary author of the state's House Bill 3979, which seeks to ban critical race theory. Toth believes that a curriculum that teaches young people about systemic racism is itself a form of racism and that both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Martin Luther King endorsed this issue, which is tantamount to the whitewashing of U.S. history at the expense of the rights of non-white citizens. This is what comes to my mind when I think of the, the white privilege supremacy laws uh, and procedures. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Um, I, uh, I was really uh, taken by your, uh, your comment about that they're equating critical race theory with something that is outside of uh, what U.S. history is all about and having a limited view of what racism is with respect to only being personal uh, attitude, volition, and behavior, when in fact the third treaty, which is the covenant to end racial discrimination that the United States uh, Senate ratified, it expressly uh, acknowledges uh, and condemns racial discrimination and obliges parties to pursue by all appropriate means and without delay a policy of elimination of racial discrimination in all its forms and those forms include the institutional and structural manifestations of it. Um, earlier when we were um, signing in to this Zoom call, uh, as far as I know, we only had uh, one of our scheduled respondents uh, on the line, and uh, that is uh, Dr. Ron Glass. I wanted to know if uh, Kelly Germain or Juan Gomez or Ken Tankersley have uh, joined by now. Kelly. Kelly has. Yeah. Okay. It looks like we're both here. I'm here. So. Oh, okay. Well, Ron, we're going to go with you, and then we'll, then we'll go with Kelly. But yeah. let, let me. Uh, Ken's on also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Well, uh, I'm going to um, introduce Ron, then Kelly, then Ken. Okay. Ron Glass, in addition to being a, a good friend for many years, uh, is a PhD and professor of philosophy of education the University of California, Santa Cruz. He is the PhD program director in the education department at UC Santa Cruz. And he is the president of the Philosophy of Education Society. He has uh, many different interviews and accolades uh, to his credit. And one of those things has to do with um, things that you can find on Pacifica Radio network where he is reflecting on revolutionary education and Paul Freire's life and ideas. Uh, Ron, um, I met Paulo Freire uh, through Ron and um, he is now acknowledged as, um, as a leading authority on um, what Paulo Freire meant when he was talking about pedagogy of the oppressed. So much so that the newest edition of Paulo Freire's book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, includes extensive commentary by Dr. Ron Glass, who uh, currently re resides in Berkeley, California. Also uh, responding is Kelly Germain, Ms. Kelly Germain, who is a trauma-informed racial equity trainer and institu institutional change strategist and researcher, and also a community organizer. She resides in North Carolina. And then uh, the last respondent is Dr. Ken Tankersley, who is an enrolled member of the Pequa Shawnee. 
He is an archaeologist teaching at the University of Cincinnati. His work has been featured on the National Geographic Channel, the Animal Planet, the History Channel, BBC Nature, Wall Street Journal, and on All Things Considered. He's the author of numerous articles and the book entitled Dr. Charles Lewis Metz and the American Indian Archaeology of Little Miami River Valley. Uh, Dr. Tankersley lives in Kentucky. So, Ron, what are your um, impressions and uh, reflections on what you've heard? Um, well, first, I have to say thank you for the invitation to um, be part, part of this conversation this morning, and I'll try to be um, brief in my comments. Um, it's, uh, I speak to you from my home in Berkeley, California, which is on uh, Ohlone lands, the Moekma Chechenya bands of the Ohlone tribe. And uh, the struggle continues here uh, over there. They're trying to preserve their local sacred shell mound from development. Um, and Dan knows a lot about that struggle from his own participation in it. Um, but I grew up a settler in the southern reaches of the Algonquin speaking peoples in the land of the Shawanwaki or the Shawnee. And uh, I actually went to uh, Shawnee school from second grade through my high school graduation. Um, and my ancestors arrived in those lands really in desperation and hope. Uh, they were running away from pogroms in one case or imprisonment in another case or orphanhood in another case. Um, and that sort of uprooted tumbleweed family got intertwined uh, with the Lene Lenape, the traditional grandparents to the Shawanwaki, um, who themselves had been driven uh, from the East Coast uh, to the Ohio River Valley lands uh, by the colonial violence that they were experiencing. So all of this violence uh, led to my own tangled settler roots uh, which grabbed hold in that land that had already been cleared of the Shawanwaki, right? The, the Shawnee and the Lenape alike, everyone was gone, pushed east to the east, you know, pushed west um, beyond the Mississippi. Um, and so my, my roots come up out of that, that slate clay of uh, left behind by the glacial scrape of Ohio, right? That, that's the clay of, of which I am. I'm a person from that valley. And uh, it's a great honor to be with you today. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation and, and to Dan and to Mike for organizing us. Um, my comments in, in listening to all this, you know, is I, I you know, white supremacy, of course, is uh, responding now like the, the cornered rats they are, right, with increasing violence. It's, it's a desperate move, you know, the, the effort to shut all this down. They understand um, that, that they are a, a people of the past, right? And I really am pleased. I spend a lot of time, I have the privilege as an elder still spending a lot of time with young people. And I see the resistance culture really on the rise. You know, it, it's Black Lives Matter uh, cross race lines, it cross class lines, it went global, um, where we, there's an energy that is afoot. And I, I feel that there's another energy um, among white people that was launched by Occupy around death. And out of the global South, women of color are leading a global campaign around debt, right? And, and understanding the way in which debt and bondage replaced slavery, right? That slavery um, depended on a kind of indebtedness. And if you weren't a slave, 
you were an indentured servant of one sort or another. There were many forms of slavery, right? And there still are. And it comes through debt and the prison system. And so those are held in place, as we've heard, by police and state violence, by our housing codes, by our miseducation that produces all this violence because the violence isn't just at the spectacular level of police killings or the hangings as it's always been, right? The violence is also really intimate, deep into our lives, into our dreams, into the intimacy of our sex lives, of our desires, of our fantasies, right? So this work is deep. And the debt and the bondage that we have been enslaved to through capitalism and through all of these systems and structures leaves not a, us owing a debt, but the debt is to us. It's reparations, it's abolition. It's time to abolish these systems. We'll never end the supremacist, the white supremacist, but we can end white supremacy. And I look to the new generations who are trying to seize this moment. And we elders have to share our wisdom, share our pain, share our suffering over these years. How many killings do we have to witness? Whoever thought, whoever thought we'd see it on TV, on instant replay, right? Whoever thought that, who thought we could be tortured in those ways? Right, but we have freedom dreams. The new generation speaks their freedom dreams. And we have to listen to that. We have to respond to the spectacular violence with spectacular nonviolence. We have to stand strong against every form of violence, whether it is the huge public displays, whether it's the murders, whether it's the school to prison pipeline. And we have to stand against the intimate violence in our home life and among genders. We have to stand against all of that. And when we can really build a movement that unearths seeds of fire to Paul Forth Highlander, my mentor, Miles Horton, not just my mentor, Paulo Fede, right? And we have to remember that race is a consequence of racism. Race is a consequence of racism and join the struggle that crosses generations, crosses so-called races, crosses so-called genders, crosses so-called classes, and understands that we are all human beings, each and every one of us. And each and every one of us has the power to make a difference in our everyday lives and in the systems that touch us and that we touch. So seize the moment and, and stand with the young folks. That's that's what I hear. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Brown, and that's what I feel from you. And it's a very uh, heartfelt uh, statement. I'm feeling that, too. Uh, next, um, Kelly, um, could you give your um, response and your impressions of the things that were said earlier in, re in response to the question that I posed? Sure. Thank you so much, Reverend Buford, and thank you for having me, everyone. Um, similar to Diana Dunn, I'm a white woman who learned everything I know about racism from people of color and other white anti-racist elders, and I'm coming to this call um, from some meetings with the, um, the Anglican Church in Canada. So I grew up in Ohio, and then I grew up back and forth in Canada, which is where my dad's from, and um, I really grew up believing that racism was a Southern thing and not something that happened on the West Coast or in the North or in, especially not in Canada. And the more that we're uncovering the history in Canada, it's, it's very identical um, to the history of the United States in the ways that some of you have already noted that the origins of white supremacy and, and voting discrimination are embedded in our foundations. So I appreciate all of the foundational conversations that have happened so far. Um, the group that we have been working with today just realized in examining their institution after they, uh, if you, I'm sure many are aware that um, last couple of weeks they uncovered 215 um, 
buried Indigenous children from the genocide of the um, residential schools in Canada and the churches up there are, are starting to reckon with their complicity in that and uh, folks in the room today started to reckon with the fact that my job is to uphold the rules of this system and yet the rules of this system continue to perpetuate racism even when they're not explicitly racist and so um, I'm just hearing that a lot in our discussion today on voting rights as well and how that's playing out in the states. Um, my experience with um, starting to understand modern forms of racism and how it relates to voting was um, first through my experience with the prisons down here in North Carolina. Um, my husband was placed as a chaplain in some of the, the prison system down here. And that's when we, as white people, first got awakened to the fact that there were whole communities of uh, people of color, particularly Black folks, who had been taken from their community and incarcerated under um, what Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow, and, and that that was intentionally designed to um, shape shift racism in a way that would rob particularly um, Black men of their ability to vote. And uh, that the, the, the implications of being incarcerated under a felony are strategically designed to strip um, Black people, particularly of their right to vote. And so um, that really awakened me to how racism just continues to shape shift and find ways to make it so that Black people cannot vote. I also, when organizing in Cincinnati, had some conversations with Indigenous folks there through the American Indian Movement around how the Electoral College is specifically designed to suppress the Indigenous vote as well. And, and so I'm sitting with all of these learnings that we've been having. Another learning that I'm concerned about with my generation that came out of organizing around the 2016 election in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, was even within our movements, um, particularly younger folks like myself, uh, there started to become this narrative that because, like we've said earlier, that the Democrats really aren't any better than the Republicans in their enacting of white supremacy, that um, there's almost this false dichotomy of that that means we shouldn't vote or that um, voting wouldn't help change anything or, or be a measure of protection. And so um, what I continued to see in, in organizing locally in Cincinnati, um, particularly as Me Too got kind of co-opted by primarily white women and started to focus almost exclusively on electoral politics to the exclusion of other things that... Um, there just became a big movement of people across race in Cincinnati who normally would have voted, but said, I'm not going to vote because it's not a radical thing to vote, that voting doesn't change anything. And, um, and so it was really, I'm still sitting with that learning because, well, that learning um, just feels like, wow, we organized so hard for, you know, numbers of years to, to get, access to voting, but then this narrative is swirling in our community that that voting is um, not a radical act. And so I'm, I'm sitting with how to build culture around um, understanding the both and of doing more than electoral politics and also engaging in electoral politics. Um, yeah, I'm also sitting with the fact that our church in Cincinnati alongside um, Dr. Washington and Reverend Billings visited us there too. And um, yeah, after doing a lot of this history lesson in our church, almost every single wealthy white person in our church, after sitting with this history, went on to vote for, for Trump um, under the, the justification that it was in their most their, their financial interest. Um, most of them now see that actually Trump never followed through on any of the <laughs> tax breaks that he had promised them. Um, but I'm, I'm continuing to sit with that lesson on on how to, to move white people with this history in a way that, that will shift um, our behavior and, and uh, response to the call for solidarity. So um, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, and thank you for your voice. Um, I think you have less gray hair than anybody else on this whole panel, so uh, you're, uh, you're, holding it, you're, <laughs> you're holding it down for the generation uh, that, that you're representing. So uh, 